Ayan. Ay, ay, katingo na. I'm awesome. <laughs> How does it feel to be in the towers you painted? Uh, so funny enough, this is actually my second time in here. Yeah. First time was just kind of getting a feel for the magnitude of the tower mm -hmm. uh, just before I painted it. And now I'm really glad that I get to be here with you also. That is insane. You're really like, <laughs> how did you feel though? Even like knowing that you were going to be a part of that, even just knowing that you were designing Soweto Tower. It's actually like awe inspiring because it feels like I get to be a part of history and like mm -hmm. so many people come to see the tower from like all over the world actually it's like that history also gets carried to other countries which is what i've always wanted my art to do so yeah i know it was a few years ago but it still <laughs> shocks me now have you had a sip of your drink uh not as yet but i could smell it, it smells amazing so we call this one karabo popi rumble in some crumble love it i've never had a drink named after me is it no it's about time <laughs> <laughs> Thank <you>. Yes. <laughs> so this whole drink is like you. It's a creative drink and is expressive um, with delight of flavor. Love it. So spicy, babes. Love it. And funny enough, whiskey and Campari is like my favorite combo. So you know, right? The show mm -hmm. is called Madness Method. Yeah. And I'm not going to ask you boring questions and all that jazz stuff you can Google. Mm. You see, I want us to play this game. So yes. you're going to pick a card, right? Mm -hmm. You'll tell me what makes you feel. Or if it's a question, you'll give me a story. OK. Make it personal. OK, cool. Mm -hmm. So this is the mind blown emoji. Mm -hmm. The moment my mind was truly, truly blown to the point where it was in pieces to this day, I still haven't been able to bring it back together, was my collaboration with Nike and having LeBron James wear my sneakers to the club. Ah, I so saw that! that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just posted a story, like took a whole thing with his phone while he was in the car saying that he's on the way to the club and like I saw my name on the sneakers. So it first started that, not a lot of people actually know this, but it started with only one sneaker design. Mm -hmm. So then I couldn't decide because the whole story of how I came to be has to do with the past, the present and the future. Yeah. So like honoring my ancestors and the first part where I saw like true representation was like in barbershops. Mm -hmm. So I wanna like honor that, but then I also wanna honor like how far we've come and in the position that we're in. And like so many black creatives are like finally getting to speak their voice in like such unique ways and like getting international recognition uh, for it, being in Times Square. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I've actually been wanting to like honor that present too. And then also speak towards the potential that I think not only South Africa, but like the African continent. And then more broadly also like people part of the African diaspora as well, mm -hmm. like not forgetting black people that have been displaced throughout the world and also speaking towards that connection coming back. Mm -hmm. So I told them like it, it's too difficult. So I'll design three sneakers and they choose one. So they told me we actually love all three. We're going to take ah. it from one sneaker to like a collection of sneakers and just seeing like how far that spread. In South Africa, we actually sold out in 10 minutes. In that the US, insane. we sold out in a day. In Japan, we sold out in a day. So just seeing all these countries that some of them I've never even been to be yeah. so receptive to my work, I was just like mind blown. So there's something special in like working within your purpose. And mm -hmm. I think um, I figured out my purpose when I was 18 that like I, I need to honor the creative side of me and I just keep on seeing like reward after reward for like honoring it back yeah. then. And I think when people really do work within their purpose, there's like an honoring that keeps coming. So I'm gonna be the only one picking cards. Literally, it's my house. Oh, you can call me to your house and you can pick, you can be, I'll pick cards. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. so you know what this looks like? The bad guy from Megamind. I forgot his name, but he's an alien that comes to steal like a certain element that we have on Earth. Mm -hmm. And this looks like how he looks when he's out of the metal suit. And it's like this purple guy with tentacles mm -hmm. looks just like the bad guy from Megamind. So is, the, is, the, is he in a suit because does he get mocked for how he looks? Um, I think on his planet, everyone looks like that, but oh. he's in a suit because he's come to Earth to come and like pillage the element that he's looking for. And then in connection to you though, um, especially with that first example with uh, having to wear a suit, 
to be, to take something from this world? Like, is there any relation? I think when I decided to start my street art career, so I decided like, I really want to work in a place or in a discipline where you wouldn't need anything except sight to be able to experience my work. Mm -hmm. So there was something about like the magnitude of how big your artwork is and it's like unmissable. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you had this responsibility to actually speak to something important. But mm -hmm. a lot of like the graffiti guys in the beginning weren't really like responsive to like me starting. It mm -hmm. was like, who's this Territorial. graphic design <laughs> illustrator <laughs> that's coming into like our space. And it was like very misogynistic, very like of masculine. Course. I think for this next part of my career, just focusing on like what's important is what I need to do. But it's almost like I had to put on that mental suit, but also a physical suit because violence against women in South Africa is unmatched. And what do street artists do? You just go with your materials, you find an empty wall. It's often like in the middle of nowhere. Imagine the vulnerable position that I'm in. If I'm creating a work, I'm focusing on like the wall. I don't know what's happening behind me. So each time I have murals, I always have to get security yeah. that's with me, that's actually making sure that I'm safe so that I actually have the same privilege as men do creating art. There's like a mental suit that I have to put on and a physical one to make sure like we get to where we want to go with regards to art here. Oh. Okay. The typeface is lit, by the way. I'm not gonna say that. Uh, where was I when I was 21? I was just graduating. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uncertainty, and I interned at an agency in Johannesburg, and it was actually like a really good experience because it taught me a lot. And mm -hmm. one of the main things was that. I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> like I had decided like I wanted to spend my time and my creativity like preserving the African aesthetic. I had just been seeing it being exploited over and over and yeah, it just like got me riled up, but in a good way that this is actually, I want to work towards changing this. Mm -hmm. I want like black people and African people to have like ownership over the work that we create. And also that like, we should be the ones profiting from what we're doing. So right, often yeah. like we come up with the idea, we, we make the idea cool, and then it seems like we get maybe 20% of what everyone else gets. If and any percent at all. Ex exactly, exactly. I'll be the representation that I wanted to see mm. when I started. So 21 was actually the age that defined where I am today. Are we gonna do another one? Absolutely. Okay, I'm You're ready. Flowing. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> this is too fun. I feel like next thing that should come out is 30 seconds. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. I promise you I'm going to beat you. Let me take this first time. 30 seconds. And I just got Pictionary, but I don't know how to play it. I'll teach you. We play Pictionary a lot. I'll teach you. Okay. Hey, what's your biggest mistake? This one's a hard one, because I try and look at things in a way where I don't like see something as a mistake. Mm -hmm. I think, hey, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Yes. Cool, thank you. Because um, I try and see things more positively. I try and look at it like you may have done something and it's not a mistake, it's just something that didn't turn out the way that you had imagined or pictured it. Mm -hmm. A mistake that stays in my head was probably not coming out to my dad as gay sooner. Um, I didn't come out to my dad until this year and mm. it was because I was so scared of him like my dad literally says all the time how I'm his favorite kid. And like, we're four kids at home. Like yeah. I have three older brothers and like, he's like such a traditional, like black sort of dad. Like you'd think obviously he'd choose like the oldest son. Yeah. No, my dad has always said like, I'm his favorite kid. And like, he comes to me, like we have, we call each other every night. We like gossip in that the night, dope. like throughout the day, he like updates me on his day. I update him. He gives me like such good advice, business, life-wise. And then I used to think that coming out to him as gay would make him see me differently and like change this like great relationship that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think like relationships with 
a father that's especially like in his 70s. My dad's much older than me. Having such a close relationship with him is something that's rare and I didn't want to ruin that. And I thought I would be ruining it by coming out to him, not because I thought that that was anything bad, but I yeah. thought like he would deem it as bad. But it was just like telling him another part of me that I never told him. And like literally when I came out to my dad, I was like, hey, so you know how I've been telling you that I'm seeing someone um, and you've been saying he and your boyfriend. I was <laughs> like, I should have corrected you. It's more like she and my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, and then he like kind of giggled. And then he was like, um, are you happy? <laughs> does, does the Tsonga lady treat you well? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, she does. And then he was like, um, oh, okay. And then like, does it mean I refer to you as gay or as lesbian? Is there a difference? And I was like, mm, the difference is like the old way of looking at it. Gay, lesbian kind of means the same thing, but I identify as lesbian. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, oh, okay, cool. His only concern is like, am I happy? And um, like, how does he refer to me so that he's not offensive? Yes. And I was like, from a 70 year old, so he's 72 actually, mm -hmm. so to dad. So, yeah, I think a mistake that like stays in my head is I should have told my dad this part of me much sooner because I think it, it would have even brought us closer because I wouldn't have felt like I'm hiding mm. something from my dad. We are getting very honest today. My dad knew because he met Stoggy in December and I'm like, uh, oh, by the way, so um, the girl you met is my girlfriend. And he's like, it's about time, f these little f boys. <laughs> I'm like, what? He was like, you chose well. Yeah, he was like, it's about Not time. That it's a choice, you should have just like dated girls from a long time ago. Cause he's just like, you're stuck with these boys like me. Mm. Right? Hey, so I'm like, I'm not stuck with them. I'm not like your wife, so, but anyway, um, we good. So it's just like, it was a different <laughs> dynamic. Yeah. And my, my partner's dad just found Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so she's just like, ah, we'll see. If but we... it doesn't mean the two are like mutually exclusive. You can be like someone that identifies as Christian and like your no. relationship with God is like close and still be gay. Like yes, it's because... not to say the two are separate. Absolutely not. Because yeah. then it means you only love Christians and you don't love other believers. Do you know what I mean? Like but it, you relate it, to Christianity. It also means you're, you're not fully grasping the concept of love, which is Christianity. Which is South Africa. Hey, that's also a tough one. Hey. It's a very tough one. Don't you find it funny that um, the most boys are homophobic here, but they lick each other without knowing the story? Because if a girl talks, it's like, oh, so you're homophobic when it comes to just being yourself and being happy and being open and say, yes, cool, great, yeah. whatever. I'm free, I'm an open person. You have to hate. And it's just like... And also, I have a problem with that phrase, like, homophobia. A phobia implies, like, you have, like, this deep fear of Rooted. something. Yeah. But it's like they're it's a... not afraid of the queer community because so many times there's like queer people that have been killed, assaulted. Mm -hmm. It's not a fear that they have. They're just No, but psychologically fears make you want to eliminate what makes you scared the most, especially then it's about not yourself. a phobia, my friend. Then it's not so a phobia. Yourself. So you're scared. Mm -hmm. it's, it's your fears that make you feel uncomfortable by someone living their lives. I think Maybe, I would treat that as social think, media. I think a phobia is like you are Sketch. an exaggerated amount of, of afraid. So it's like way deeper. I think it's a combination of just like having inherent hate and dislike and like discrimination. I think some people just like have that within them and it's like they don't know any other way to operate. So they must be hating something or must be disliking something or must be able to discriminate against something. Mm -hmm. And just some people choose to discriminate against queer people. Oh. Okay, let me see. Wow! Yes, child, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, rival. Hmm. 
Not many people know this. This game is making me divulge all my secrets. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but I was actually bullied when I was in high school, like all throughout high school, for being like super tall and like I was still awkward. So I had like a larger head and like I was the only sort of girl there. I think maybe I had rivals when I was in high school from being bullied. Mm -hmm. But low key bullying kind of gave me like the strength to like push past even when things are hard. So it's like a rival that actually became like good for my character because like I don't give up very easily even when things are hard mm -hmm. and like words become things that are easier to shake off than if I didn't have that experience. Even I was bullied, I was bullied for my bums my, Is it? and this line because I've got this permanent line outside of contouring oh, and so they all tease me about it. Now I'm just like oh so you're teasing me for the currency because <laughs> now you're paying for the features I got teased for. Thanks. Which is also so weird because Things that you were teased for before are like things that, that people are coveting now. Yes. Yeah, exactly. People are paying money to be able to look like that because they didn't get it naturally. Strange. Even a nickname for well, having a big bum and just like, okay, shout. But now you're older and you're like, ah, ah. Like, I used to get Do you know made when fun God of... made you? Yeah. They, they, they slept, they're like, okay, shout, you're alive. Go, <laughs> you go. can go. They're like, ooh, child. Okay, let's get some. Ah. Love it. <laughs> Okay. Let's continue. This is too great, though. Okay, so this one is South Africans must stop. Mm -hmm. I feel bad saying this, but there's a few things that I'm thinking. Yeah. And I think in all these things that I think South Africans must stop is prioritizing one over the other. Like, men are prioritizing themselves over women. We're Owning seeing... a penis is number one exactly. human in the world. Exactly. And we're like prioritizing South Africans over like other Africans or people in other countries. Like we're prioritizing straight people over queer people. Like that I think is something like that imbalance is something that we need to stop. We need to start seeing like equality for like what it is. And actually, you know what, because I know how annoying it can be to have to feel like a spokesperson. Like we'll have a conversation outside where it's like, oh no, she told me that they're not she or he. They didn't know what non-binary meant. People seem to mess up pronouns quite a lot. And I think it's because you're still seeing gender as something that's like a dichotomy. You're still seeing like male and it looks like this and it acts like this and female, it looks like this and it acts like this. Like you need to deconstruct gender completely. Like I identify as she and her but I've been misgendered as him and sir so many times. And it's just like having people still see very masculine traits as like belonging to one yeah. gender where that's not the case. So I think like once you start de deconstructing the image or conventional idea of like female and male, that mm. would like help you understand like non-binary a little bit more. So it's that thing of like, you can make an excuse, but when you're conscious, you make an attempt. So now, actually, because uh. we're never going to stop. <laughs> this part, you choose three cards, right? OK, we each choose three. Oh, no. I told oh, I mouth. choose three. Yes, child. OK. <laughs> three cards. And then after those three, you're going to give me a full story. So we have the poop emoji. It was my idea first, mm -hmm. and then we have a little vinyl record. Um, I think if I didn't become an illustrator, street artist, slash graphic designer, I would have wanted to get into music. Mm -hmm. So music's been something that's like, just like always followed my life. Even like when my dad would tell me like bedtime stories, he'd come up like with a song mm -hmm. to go with that story. Nice. So he used to like pretty much tell me the Bible in, like Song. story form, so then he'll be like, yeah, this is the story of King David. And mm -hmm. then he'd tell me like David's story, and then he'll tell me like stories about Moses. And then like he'd make up songs at the time. So like music <laughs> has been like from there until now, like playing five instruments and all of that, I would have gone into music. Mm -hmm. And when I think about it, doing illustration and art wasn't my first idea. My first idea was to become a doctor, that was my first idea. And I'm really glad I didn't do that because I think I may have been a <laughs> doctor. <Yeah. laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think my heart would have been there for people and like helping people, but I find 
that I think I may be a better illustrator than a doctor. <laughs> and that's why I admire <laughs> doctors and what they're able to do. Because if I had seen that much blood, I think I would have been a doctor. Sorry. For real. <laughs> yeah, and that's the, the story that I have. Would have been music, would have been a doctor. That was my first idea. But in the end, would have probably been a musician, a doctor, and I'm glad that I'm where I am now. This is too epic. No, I, I love need this. Another drink from and I love the so... drink also. Kind of what's this drink called? It's yes. the Karabo Poppy Rumble in the Jungle. Crumble. That Crumble. one. Mm.